Okay, today we're going to talk about internal controls and some controls into the cash account. I'm going to discuss fraud as well, not in any particular, any real detail, but I want to mention some basic concepts. First, let's talk about fraud. Uh, this is not a class in forensic accounting, obviously, and so we're just going to talk in very broad uh, terms. But there's uh, been what's called the fraud triangle, which is a concept which identifies three elements that are involved in fraudulent activity. First, the person, and believe it or not, they call this person the fraudster, who uh, commits this crime, whatever it may be, has pressure of some sort. Usually it's either financial pressure or risk of losing a job. Um, they're living beyond their means. Uh, they're afraid they're going to uh, lose a bonus, their stock options are going to go down in value. Something is causing a perceived pressure in that person's mind. Then there's opportunity, and opportunity relates to weakness in a company's internal controls, which is the, which is the connection between fraud and internal controls. Okay, and so when a person sees an opportunity, it's because the company has not prevented this opportunity from occurring, and this person thinks they can both commit and conceal this activity. And then the third element is called rationalization. And this is just human behavior. And I'm not a psychologist, but people love to rationalize their own behavior. And as it relates to the job, we've all heard people say, nobody appreciates what I do. I'm underpaid and I'm overworked and that person makes more than me, but they do less work. Or when you take office supplies like uh, some post-its or a pencil or something or perhaps an old unused computer, you say to yourself, oh, and not that of course I've ever done that, but uh, people will say, well, the company's not going to miss it. They're not even using it. Or this is a big company. They can afford to lose a ream of paper. Okay, this is rationalization. And in most cases of fraud, the person rationalizes their behavior. And then of course is just pure criminal mentality where they don't care. They simply want whatever it is and they don't care whose it is and if they're causing harm. All right, so anyway, so these are the three elements of fraud. And fraud can be either in the form of theft or embezzlement, what they call misappropriation, which is basically stealing, uh, or in the form of financial statement modification, whether they're intentionally uh, applying gap incorrectly or they're intentionally leaving something out or intentionally putting something in or poorly disclosing a transaction. There's a lot of ways in which you can manipulate your financial statements and this all falls under the fraud category. Okay, and So this is really beyond the scope of this course but it relates to the concept of internal controls. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about next. All of us in our personal lives employ a variety of internal controls. We lock our front door at night. We lock our car when we leave our car. We conceal our password to our ATM, our debit card, for obvious reasons. These are examples of internal controls to protect ourselves from theft, unauthorized access, okay? And companies do the same thing. Their goals or the objectives of internal controls are to make sure that they can produce accurate and reliable financial statements to protect, and sometimes use the word safeguard, assets like inventory, machines, cash, etc., from theft, from damage, and in the case of your sensitive accounting records like payroll, uh, research and development, that type of thing, from unauthorized access. And then we want to make sure that we're not breaking any laws or regulations or contractual obligations and that the company's policies are being uh, properly followed by the employee. So internal controls are policies and procedures that are designed to ensure that we achieve these three primary objectives. Okay, in order to achieve the objectives of internal controls, we have to design a system of internal controls. Okay, and notice we have a, a mnemonic, which is a memory tool to help you memorize the five components or the five elements of an internal control system, okay? Control activities, sometimes called control procedures. Risk assessment, information and communication, monitoring, and the control environment. And I simply switched the words control environment so I could create the mnemonic crime 
to help you, ele uh, to help you memorize the five elements of internal control. So we're going to talk about these five elements. First, control procedures, control activities, these are transaction-related and operating, day-to-day -day operating-related controls. And we've, there are many of them. And again, we're only scratching the surface here, being that this is an introduction to financial accounting. So we're going to just talk about a few of the more important ones. First, this is an important concept in internal control, the idea of separating what we call incompatible job functions. Okay? And what this means is you don't want to have one person performing two or more of these functions because then they're in a position to not only uh, perpetrate a, some sort of fraudulent activity, but then to cover their tracks and make it more difficult for the crime to be identified. And so in an ideal scenario, we want to separate these jobs and have different people doing these jobs. Okay, and more specifically, the person who does the accounting, accounts payable, accounts receivable, payroll, that's the accounting or recording function. We don't want that person having custody of assets. That means we don't want them handling cash. They shouldn't be in charge of our inventory, okay? And so we want to separate the custody of assets function from the accounting function. And then the person who does periodic reconciliations, like the bank reconciliation, or what we call the book to physical inventory reconciliation, okay? If you've ever on your job helped to count inventory, you're quantifying inventory, okay? And then someone else is going to compare what you've counted to what's on the inventory record and reconcile if there's any differences. And that's what we mean by the independent reconciliation function. In a big company, this is best performed by the internal audit department. Okay? Smaller companies don't have the luxury of hiring internal auditors. It's just too expensive. But big companies do. And internal auditors simply test to make sure internal control procedures are being properly enforced and that hopefully nothing, no funny business is taking place out there. Or if it is, they're going to discover it and limit the damage that's being inflicted. Okay, well, if we go back to the previous slide just for a minute, we noticed that, excuse me, two slides ago, one of our objectives was to protect assets and records from theft, damage, and unauthorized access. Well, how do we accomplish that? Well, we do that by establishing controls, physical controls to protect assets and records from theft, damage, and unauthorized access. S things as simple as putting locks on doors, locking up inventory, making sure cash is either in a safe or in the bank, locking up your records, password controls on computers, okay? If you have perishable items, proper refrigeration so it doesn't get damaged from heat or from the sun or whatever it may be, these are all very common sense controls but are very important to a company achieving their objectives. Companies process literally millions and in some, times case, some cases billions of transactions every year and they have to document these transactions. They have to capture this information. Every time you go to a store, Target, Walmart, Kmart, and they scan the barcode of what you purchase, that information is being captured and it's being recorded in a sales journal. It's updating inventory. It's affecting the accounting system. So we need very well-designed and very detail-oriented documentation procedures. Now, you can take an entire class just on documentation control. Here, the only thing I really want to point out is the concept that documents need to be pre-numbered. Think of your checks, if you still write checks. They're pre-numbered, so you can keep track of all the checks. If they weren't pre-numbered, you have no idea, you would have no idea if there was a check or two or three missing, or an entire book, and then someone's out there writing checks. So you have to pre-number documents. Same thing with purchase orders, sales orders, receiving reports, all these what we call source documents have to be pre-numbered so that we can keep track of the numerical sequence and we can identify any missing documents. It's very important. Also, documents, are more, more often than not, will have to be multi-copy, meaning we have more than one copy, a carbon copy, even though it could be an electronic form. And let me give you an example. A purchase order. Okay, and we're going to talk more about this 
when we talk about controls over cash disbursements, but a purchase order is a good internal control where when we want to buy stuff from a vendor, we have to issue a properly authorized purchase order. Because let's take a look, quick look at a purchase order. and We don't need to look at the details, but to illustrate the concept of a multi-copy document, here's the first copy of the purchase order, and this will go to the vendor. And that's a D, believe it or not. There we go. Then we'll have a second copy, and this may stay with the purchasing department. And then we'll have a third copy, and this will go to the receiving area because we're expecting a shipment. And I might have another copy, and this goes to accounts payable. And I might have yet another copy for the department that initiated the order. Okay, so multi-copy documents are very commonly used in any business, and it's, it's an important internal control that we refer to as a documentation procedure. And then we have human resource-related controls, making sure that we hire appropriate people, that they're not criminals, they're not high-risk candidates, they're properly qualified. These are all pro internal controls, background checks. Bonding is an insurance measure where if a company bonds an employee and that employee steals, the insurance company will cover the amount of the loss. So the insurance company is going to do a background check and an interview, perhaps a lie detector test, depending on the circumstances. Banks are good examples of companies that, because you're handling cash, they will have mandatory vacation, where they force the employee to take a couple of weeks off a year, and then someone rotates into their function, like a bank teller, for example, and if there's something unusual going on, they have a higher likelihood of identifying a problem while that person's gone than if that person is there kind of manning the fort, so to speak. Okay, so these are some examples of control activities. And again, we're just scratching the surface here. Risk assessment. This is the second element. We're marching down the list crime. Risk assessment. A company, and sometimes the com big companies will have what's called a risk officer. Their job is to identify sources of risk, and this relates to insurance as well. But risk can come from external sources as well as internal sources. Examples of external risk would be your competitors, any new laws or regulations that are passed that affect your product or your service, technology, I mean, look at the music industry, uh, the newspaper industry, cameras, all these things that have gone digital or online or MP3, whatever, it's having an enormous impact on companies' businesses. New accounting rules, they have to be properly implemented or else our financial statements are going to be misstated. Sources of internal risk can be from simple growth and expansion where we're hiring lots of new employees. Well, these people have to be trained and they have to be properly supervised since new employees, and we've all been new employees, make more mistakes. They have to make sure they know what they're doing. If we um, implement a new accounting information system, new computers, new software for bigger growing companies that's more sophisticated, more complex. We have to make sure it's properly installed, tested, debugged, or else we're going to have problems that enter our accounting system and our financial statements are going to be way off. Okay? Uh, companies have to make sure that they have a safe operating environment so people don't slip on slippery floors. If, for example, in, in the um, maintenance yard of a company that has a lot of vehicles. There's no low beams where people can bang their head or slip or wires or anything like that. And companies, insurance companies, will come out and evaluate if it's a high-risk area. And then, of course, there's the what's called OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And they'll also come out and look at, at an organization's operating environment to see if it's in violation of safe operating conditions. Okay, and so all these things represent risk, and a company has to identify all sources of risk from external sources and internal sources and see how do we address this so we can run our business as efficiently as and effectively and as safely as possible. Information and communication. This is what we call the accounting information system. This is how we record, process, and report a mountain of information. Think of Walmart, all the transactions. Every time you go in there and buy something from Walmart, that's a transaction. They have tens of billions of transactions every year. How do you get this literal mountain of information ultimately onto four pieces of paper? Income statements, 
retained earnings, balance sheet, cash flows, well, that's an enormous summarization process, and that's what the accounting information system does. Okay, the accounting information system is part of a company's overall management information system, how they capture all necessary information and input it into the system and generate all the reports they're going to need to get feedback and to run their business properly. So the information and communication, which is our accounting information system, includes hardware, all the computers, monitors, printers, uh, servers, all the software, the operating systems, the applications, the general ledger software, the payroll, the inventory software, receivables, payables, all, all these types of software programs. All the different documents, what we call source documents, okay, whether it's a sales order, a purchase order, a receiving report, okay, all sorts of documents that we create internally to process information. And different people within the organization and external sometimes need copies of this. And the purchase order is a good example of a source document where the vendor's external, purchasing, receiving accounts payable are internal, but they all need pieces of this information in order to do their job. All the accounting, the general journal where we record journal entries, the ledgers where the T accounts are, the financial reports, and not just the financial statements, but all other types of analysis that take place to get feedback on a day-to-day -day basis. All the people involved in the accounting process, okay, and how information gets communicated to these various different parties on a timely basis so that we can run our business properly. This is all collectively called the information and communication part of our accounting system, our internal control structure. Monitoring. Once we design a system of internal controls, it has to be properly communicated to employees, it has to be enforced to make sure people are following it, and we have to monitor it because as a company grows and expands and starts operating their business in new states and new countries and new laws are passed and new products are launched and new accounting rules are, are issued, our internal controls have to be updated, expanded, modified, changed as necessary. What works today will be inadequate and inappropriate six months to a year from now. So we always have to monitor internal controls, which means enforcement and keeping them up to date and appropriate as our circumstances and environment changes. And then last, and some would argue most importantly, is what's called the control environment. And notice in parentheses I put the tone from the top. This is the message that upper management sends to its employees throughout the organization. Typically when you have crime and fraud in a company, and we're talking about a lot of large dollars, it comes from upper management. That doesn't mean all upper management is bad, it simply means that if you have ethical leaders in the business and you have a code of conduct that is properly communicated and enforced, you're going to have a more ethical business environment. And when you have unethical people at the top levels of management, and sadly there are plenty of them out there, then it kind of works its way through the system. That doesn't mean that, that everyone gets corrupted, okay? But top management is the one who has the authority and the power to communicate what is tolerated and what will not be tolerated in forms of behavior, how we treat our customers, how we manufacture our products, okay? The level of um, enforcement through internal auditing, et cetera. And so the control environment is really the kind of just, it's just the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of the, the tone and the, the, the feeling you get when you walk into a bank, you know there's a lot of internal controls in place. It's a very controlled environment. Some companies are very loose. Pr startup companies typically have very uh, poor internal controls, okay? And so this is developed over time to make sure that we're achieving those objectives that we saw earlier, and by designing the five components of an internal control structure, we can achieve those objectives. And it starts with upper management recognizing the importance of an internal control environment. Okay, and so this is what we're talking about here. So if, if upper management understands the importance of internal controls, okay, and that we need to have controls in place to prevent things from happening, then we have a better chance of a system being divined, uh, designed that will 
uh, achieve these objectives. Now, <clears throat> there's no such thing as a perfect set of internal controls. Okay, and we call these inherent limitations of internal control. You can design a great system. And we talked earlier about the importance of separating incompatible job functions. You don't want, for example, you don't want the person who handles cash to be the same person who is updating our accounts receivable. Those are considered to be incompatible jobs. So you want to separate those two different people, two different areas. Okay, so you've done that, but suppose these two people eat lunch every day in the lunchroom and they become friends and they talk about their job and they start complaining and, oh, I'm underpaid and overworked and, you know, this, you know the routine. And this person says, yeah, oh, believe me, I know. I see how much money is coming in. I account for it every day. And this person goes, I know. I handle the cash every day. I wish there was something I could do where they wouldn't find out and the two can work together. We call that collusion. When two people work together to get around, we call undermine or bypass internal controls. Okay, and that's called collusion. You can't stop collusion from happening. You can make it difficult for them to be successful. You can make the penalty for getting caught severe, losing your job, uh, criminal prosecution, etc. but you can't stop people from trying. So collusion is an, a, as a limitation of any internal control structure. Management override means at a sufficiently high level of management, they can override or bypass or get around controls because they have that level of authority. Okay? This is usually at the highest levels of management. Okay? But typically when big companies, um, when you see the officers being accused of fraud and embezzlement, and you're talking typically hundreds of millions of dollars, it's because they have that type of authority where they can bypass internal controls which were designed to prevent that from happening in the first place. And so the top level managers in some companies, okay, have that ability, have that authority that they can kind of skirt the rules, so to speak. And then internal controls can be very well designed, but they can't prevent all types of mistakes and errors from occurring. You can prevent illogical inputting. If I'm inputting numbers, I can't input letters. Okay, the field, the program is designed to reject a letter uh, entry where it wants a number. If it's looking for social security, I gotta input nine digits. If I'm inputting credit cards and I check Visa, it knows it has to begin with a number four, for example, or MasterCard with a number five. So you can design good controls, prevent certain types of mistakes, but you can't prevent someone from doing what's called a transposition error. I meant to input 736 and I input 637. The computer can't read our minds at this point in time. Okay, so if I'm tired, fatigued, distracted, upset, whatever, and I make mistakes, a computer can only do so much. So these are what we call inherent limitations of any internal control structure. You can't prevent it. You can try to minimize it. And good, good internal controls will minimize this from happening, but you can't completely 100% prevent this from happening. Okay. <clears throat> We want to also look at some basic internal controls related to cash receipts and cash disbursements. And then the only number crunching we're going to do in this lecture has to do with a bank reconciliation. This is kind of a very wordy chapter uh, in terms of the discussion. There's not a lot of, there's no journal entries and not a whole lot of number crunching. It's more concepts. Cash receipts. Well, generally the rule is don't sit on cash, get it into the bank. So deposit checks and cash daily. Don't sit on cash. It runs the risk of being misplaced, stolen, etc. <clears throat> checks should have a restrictive endorsement. And that simply means you stamp on the back of it, and you've seen this, for deposit only to this account number. Okay? So if you lose the check, it can't be cashed. Okay? And so you restrictively endorse the check as soon as you get it. If you have cash on the premises, it needs to be safeguarded, right? So you have a a safe of some sort to protect the cash. All right. If you have a cash register, one receipt, one copy of the receipt has to go to a customer, and then you have an internal receipt. Now it might be electronic, or it might simply be paper that's being spooled internally, and then someone other than the cashier at the end of the day reconciles the cash drawer to the cash tape and identifies any discrepancies between the cash in the box and what the register says they should have cameras, securities, alarms, et cetera. All you have to do is go to the mall 
and you see all sorts of good internal controls to protect assets, inventory, and cash. Um, okay, and so uh, there's all sorts of good things going on out there. And this, again, this is a general discussion, so we don't get into any real detail here. But just if you, you know, kind of think about what you've observed at various stores, these are all very important internal controls. Um, you know, plain, uh, plain clothes security guards, for example. Okay, for disbursements or cash payments, we have little purchases, which we would pay from petty cash. And we're not even going to talk about petty cash. The word petty tells us it's a very small amount. And just briefly, petty cash is when you need to go out and buy a can of coffee for the kitchen, a ream of paper from uh, Office Depot. Maybe you put uh, 25 bucks of gas in the company pickup truck. Small day-to-day -day expenditures. For big expenditures, when you need to restock inventory, you're buying a lot of office supplies or office furniture or computers, then we use a voucher system. Okay? And so let's just take a brief look at this. First, it starts with a purchase requisition. Any department, for example, I used to work in quality control of a manufacturing company. And if we ran out of a certain chemical that we needed to test the raw materials, I would fill out a purchase requisition, then my supervisor would have to approve that purchase requisition. A requisition is a request for something to be purchased. Big companies centralize the purchasing function. That's a very important internal control. You don't want to give many different people the authority to purchase goods on a company's behalf. That's a recipe for trouble. So you centralize purchasing. And who does the purchasing? A purchasing department. So we forward the purchase requisition to the purchase department. The purchasing department, their job is to research who are the various different vendors out there who can give us the best price, meet our qualitative needs. If I'm Boeing uh, airplanes, I don't want to buy the cheapest rivets to keep my wings on a plane. I need to make sure that they meet my qualitative needs. And I'm going to negotiate a price since I'm going to buy an awful lot of these things. Okay, so purchasing is involved with identifying the best vendors out there to supply our various needs. And then the purchasing department authorizes and issues a purchase order. Okay, remember we talked about the purchase order on the board here. They send a copy to the, per to the vendor. Okay? Most vendors will not fulfill a request unless it's supported by an authorized purchase order. And that's a good internal control. Okay? Now, at some point, they're going to ship the goods to us, and when they arrive, we fill out a receiving report to make sure that what we received is what we ordered, the descriptions match, the quantities match, okay? And we're going to forward a copy. The accounts payable department gets a copy of the receiving report. They also get a copy of the purchase order because it's accounts payable that's going to receive the vendor invoice, which is the bill. They want to get paid. And so we want to make sure that what they bill us is what we ordered and what we received. Okay, so we match all these documents to make sure everything matches properly, descriptions, quantities, prices, etc. And we call this collectively the voucher package. And before we submit the voucher package to the controller or the treasurer to pay this bill, the accounts payable department makes sure everything matches properly, and then they forward this voucher package to be paid on whatever the due date is. Maybe we're going to pay it in 30 days. Maybe we're going to pay it in 10 days to take advantage of a purchase discount. Remember 210 net 30. Okay? And at some point we cut a check, and um, most businesses include what's called a remittance advice. Okay, remittance advice is that other piece that when, if you've ever seen checks from businesses where you, it's perforated, you tear it off, and it describes what the payment is for, if it's to pay certain invoices, it'll list the invoice numbers, et cetera. Okay? So these are uh, internal controls related to purchasing. And as a general rule of thumb, we talked about protecting assets and records from theft, from unauthorized use. And so if you have unused checks, unused purchase orders, if you have a, if you have a signing machine for companies that literally cut hundreds of checks every week, then you want to make sure these are locked up when they're not in use. Okay? Good internal controls. Okay, let's talk about a bank reconciliation. Now, in the old days, it was 
extremely important for people and businesses, and still, it still is, especially for businesses, to make sure you reconcile what your, your cash records say you have with what the bank says you have. Okay? Now, these days where people can check their bank balance online and where transactions clear very, very quickly, typically within 24 hours when you're paying a business, then a, you usually, when you go online, you're pretty close to seeing what you actually have. Okay? It's still a good idea to record your purchases, whether it's with a check or a debit card, etc. And then when you get your, bank, uh, your monthly bank statement, to reconcile the difference between what your records say you have and what the bank thinks you have. Now, the reason the two numbers are more often than not different is because of timing issues. So let's take a look at what a reconciling item or transaction is. Reconciling item is when either we or the bank have accounted for something, but the other side has not yet accounted for it. And that's simply a timing issue. Okay, so a reconciling transaction can be either we've accounted for it, but the bank has not yet accounted for it, or the bank has accounted for it, but we have not yet accounted for it. And it's due to timing. Because remember, at some point in time, the bank literally has to hit the print button to print your monthly bank statement, whether it's electronic or on paper. They still at some point have to cut off, that's what we call cut off, the transaction, say, okay, as of... 5 p.m. April 30th, here's what the bank thinks we have. Okay? Now, at that point in time, they're aware of certain things that we may not yet have accounted for, and they're not aware of certain, certain things that we have accounted for. So let's take a look at these reconciling items. Remember, if a transaction has been accounted for by us and has also been accounted for by the bank, it's not a reconciling item. If neither of us have accounted for something, it's not a reconciling item. It's only when one side has accounted for it, but the other side has not yet accounted for it. And that's due predominantly due to timing issues and sometimes because of errors. Okay, we have accounted for it. The bank has not yet accounted for it. So we have two primary reconciling items in this category, outstanding checks and outstanding deposits, which are commonly called deposits in transit. Okay, now, when you write a check to someone, to a store for something, you give them a check and you subtract it from your checkbook because you assume that they're going to deposit that check in the next day or two. But that's really out of your control. So if I give someone a check for 100 bucks, I subtract that amount from my checkbook and that person may sit on that check for a day, a week, a month, for six months, it's out of my control. More often than not, they're going to deposit the money relatively quickly. But it doesn't always happen that way. So if I write a check on April 29th or 30th, I subtract it, my bank doesn't know about it until that person presents that check for payment. Then their bank contacts my bank, all done electronically. They check to see I have sufficient funds, I have enough money, and then they pay the amount. Okay? So an outstanding check means I've written a check that has not yet been deposited okay, by that person. Same thing with the uh, outstanding deposit or deposit in transit. I may have put a check in the ATM machine at 9 o'clock at night, and if that was on April 30th, most banks stop posting transactions to their records at 4 o'clock or at 6 o'clock p.m., and so that will not post till the following day, which means it's not going to make it onto this month's bank statement. When I used to travel on business, and this is you know, several years ago, I would, if I had a check and I was flying out of town, I would simply sign the check and I'd drop it with a deposit slip in the mail and it would take a few days for the U.S. mail to deliver the amount to the bank. Okay, and so you can have a timing difference with deposits in transit. We've accounted for it. Bank did not yet know that it was out there when they printed that month's bank statement. They'll find out in a few days, but it won't be on this month's bank statement. Bank has accounted for it. We have not yet accounted for it, okay? Now, sometimes you get hit with a monthly charge, or sometimes if you let your balance drop below a certain limit, like 100 bucks or 300 bucks, you get dinged for a 10, 15, 20 dollar service charge. And, some, some, and you may not even realize it until you get your bank statement, okay? 
electronic fund transfers, EFT. Most of us get paid with direct deposit. Some of us make house payments electronically, uh, car payments, auto bill pay, et cetera. Now, if, for example, you make a house payment monthly electronically, it's automatically withdrawn, and if you record that on the 10th day of each month when it takes place, then it's not a reconciling item. It's only when you get your bank statement and you see, oh, okay, that payment was made, I better update my records, then the bank is accounted for because they paid it. You didn't update your records yet, so now you need to update your records. That's what we mean by a reconciling item. If you know that every month on the 10th you make a car or a house payment and you record it, it's not a reconciling item because it's already there. You've accounted for it, bank has accounted for it. Non-sufficient funds or NSF. This is when somebody bounces a check, writes a check that they don't have the money for, and so it wouldn't, it wouldn't clear. So if a customer, for example, writes you a check, when you receive the check, you, restore, you record the receipt of cash. You debit cash in your credit accounts receivable or maybe sales, and then your bank notifies you that the check didn't clear, they didn't have enough money. Okay, so it bounced, it's a bad check. So now you don't have that money. So you gotta update your records to subtract that amount, and now you gotta go chasing after the customer, say, hey, you still owe me 100 bucks, you probably hit them for a, for a fee for your, for your uh, time you have to spend. And then either side can make errors, and when you discover those errors, you simply have to correct them. Now remember, in our personal lives, we don't record journal entries, but a business, how do they update their records? Through journal entries. So we're gonna take a look at a bank reconciliation, and I would like you to know how to do a bank reconciliation, but you don't have to worry about the journal entries. I'm not gonna ask you to prepare journal entries associated with this, but I will talk about them and we'll go through them. Okay, so let's take a look. Here's our example. Okay, I've already cleared the board. We have, let's get my marker out, this data. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up two columns. Okay, cash per books. Now books means our general ledger. Our records, in other words, okay? But I need the room, so I'm gonna get rid of our general ledger. So when you say books, that's our, our business's records. And that amount is 17,200. And over here, I'm gonna put cash per bank. And the word per simply means according to. And that's 16,316. So the bank statement for this month says we have 16,000 $316, our records say we have 17,200. Both numbers are probably wrong because of these reconciling items. Certain things we haven't accounted for yet that the bank has included, and vice versa. Certain things we've accounted for but the bank hasn't uh, accounted for yet. So the reconciliation says, okay, if both sides, as of this moment in time, knew everything that was out there, they should have the same number. And that's the purpose of a bank reconciliation. So let's take a look at these reconciling items, and then hopefully things will work out. Okay, now a deposit in transit, if I put a check in the ATM machine at nine o'clock at night, I have accounted for it, but it's not on the bank statement, okay? So I've accounted for it, bank has not yet accounted for it. They'll find out about it the next day, but it's not in that bank statement balance for this month. So I'm gonna add, and I'm just gonna abbreviate, deposits in transit, and that's 4,800. Outstanding checks, I wrote a few checks that have not yet cleared the bank. They're sitting in people's wallets, at their desks, whatever, they just simply haven't gone to the bank yet. But we know it's gonna happen. The vast, vast majority of checks that you write will get cashed, okay? I've already subtracted those amounts from my balance, from my book balance. Bank has not yet accounted for them because they haven't been presented for payment. But since we know it's gonna happen, when the bank finds out about them, and I'm just gonna abbreviate again, outstanding checks, then they're gonna have to pay those amounts and our balance will go down, 2,400. Okay, then there was a non-sufficient fund check. One of our customers wrote us a check for 500 bucks. We said, oh great, 
500 bucks, debit, cash, credit accounts receivable. Then the bank informs us, check didn't clear. So guess what? We don't have that money. And now we got to go chasing after that customer. So in my own accounting records, I have to subtract the NSF check for $500. Okay? And then down here, I would have to record a journal entry debiting cash, excuse me, debiting accounts receivable, crediting cash for 500. Remember, these have already been accounted for by us in our records. These reconciling items have not been accounted for us yet, by us yet. We have to update our records. How do we do that? By recording journal entries. Then there's a bank service charge. Okay, so we let our balance drop below that defined limit and they automatically dinged us for 20 bucks. You know, so we have to subtract the service charge, $20. Remember, banks already accounted for it. They took it out of our account. We're, we see that on the bank statement. Now we have to update our record. Okay, so I would simply debit miscellaneous expense or bank service charge expense, and I would credit cash. Notice all these journal entries will either be a debit or a credit to cash since we're updating cash. Okay, now. It's very common for companies to arrange for a customer to pay the bank directly. And so in this example, it says note collected by a bank. This is a note receivable. We've arranged with our customer and the bank that the customer will pay the bank directly. They'll put it into our account, and then the bank will notify us that they've collected money for us. Okay? And they'll typically collect interest as well, but we're simply going to keep it simple. So the note that was collected by the bank, if the bank collected it, they've already accounted for it. They're notifying us that, hey, we've collected 2,000 bucks for you guys from a customer. We have to update our record. Plus, I'll put NR, note receivable, NR, note receivable, collected by the bank, $2,000. And then I'm gonna debit cash, 2,000 and I'm going to credit note receivable, 2000 Okay, to update my record. Now remember what I said earlier. I want you to know how to do a bank reconciliation, and I, I can ask you questions about if all we have, for example, outstanding checks, you need to know that, oh, I would have to subtract that from the balance for the bank. Or if I said, what do you do with a deposit in transit? You would say, oh, I would add that to the balance for the bank. What do we do with a non-sufficient fund charge? I would subtract that from the balance per hour record. If there was an electronic fund transfer, depends if it's a payment or a receipt, okay, but we would update our records, service charge, subtract from the balance for bank. So I'd like you to know what to do with these transactions and to be able to do a simple reconciliation. I'm not gonna ask you to prepare journal entries. I simply wanted to show them to you. Okay, and then the last one says accounting error, check, 1226, which was recorded for $326, we recorded it as $362. So this requires a little bit of a discussion here. Let me just set this one up briefly so you can see what happened. For example, let's just say that we purchased $326 of office supplies on account from Office Depot. So we would have debited supplies, and I'm not going to put the debit to supplies on the board, but I would have credited accounts payable for 326. Well, at the end of the month, we submit the voucher package for payment, and they write a check for $326. The check was correct. However, the accounts payable clerk made what's called a transposition error she switched the six and the two, it became a, instead of a two six, it became a six two. So what she did was, she debited accounts payable for 362, and she credited cash for 362, even though the check was for 326. She made an error, human error, it happens. So our cash, was reduced by more than it should have been. We reduced it by 362. We should have only reduced it by 326. So here, 
I'm showing a $36 debit balance in accounts payable. Remember, accounts payable is a liability. Okay? They have a normal credit balance. So we know something's weird going on here if I have a debit balance in accounts payable, and it's because I made an error. So to correct this, I have to add back $36 to cash and to accounts payable. So I'm going to add the error from check number 1226. I'm simply going to add $36 back. Okay, and there are all my reconciling items. Now, the journal entry, and I'm going to simply have to put it over here. Debit cash for 36. Credit accounts payable for 36. Notice that the credit to accounts payable will zero out accounts payable because we paid off the bill in full. We bought 326 worth of supplies, and we actually paid them 326. We simply recorded it wrong. So I'm fixing this error. And that's what's happening here. The journal entry puts $36 back in cash because we subtracted too much. Instead of subtracting 326, we subtracted 362. So we have to add back 36 because we only paid 326. Okay, so I add back $36 and everything's back in balance. I'm going to erase this because I want to put the totals here. Okay, and so if we add these things up, if I did my math correctly, double underscore, and we call this the adjusted balance. Okay, on both sides. I'll have to abbreviate here. Adjusted balance, 18,000. 716 in our records and the bank. And this is what the number should be when both sides are fully aware of everything that's out there, but because of timing differences, they simply haven't recorded it yet as of the day of the reconciliation. Okay? And so anyway, so this is a bank reconciliation. If you do everything correctly and you put the reconciling item on the appropriate side, the adjusted balance on both sides should be the same amount. Okay. Now remember, these two transactions we've already accounted for, we don't have to record an additional journal entry. We've already accounted for them. These items, these reconciling items, we have to update our records so we had four different adjusting entries. Okay. And so uh, again, uh, don't worry about preparing these journal entries. I simply want to show them. But I would like you to be familiar with the concept of a bank reconciliation. Okay. Last item we're going to talk about is the concept of cash equivalence. Now, if you look at any company's balance sheet, you will see the first line in current assets says cash and cash equivalence. So what is a cash equivalent? Well, as the word equivalent suggests, it's something that's pretty similar to what cash is. Okay, so in order for an investment to be considered a cash equivalent, or the same as cash, it has to have these three characteristics. It has to be very low risk of losing value. So stock, common stock of any company, is never a cash equivalent. Okay, So it's typically an interest-bearing investment, but it has to be very low risk, has to be very liquid, meaning we could easily convert it to cash, and in the event, in the, in the case of a, what we call a debt security, and we give you some examples down below, a CD, U.S. Treasury bill, it has to mature, which means we're going to get paid back. Okay, when it comes due, it matures. We get our money back in three months or less. Now, as you probably know, a certificate of deposit, you can get a three-month, a six-month, a one-year, two-year, five-year. If it's a three-month CD, then it's a cash equivalent. If it's a six-month or beyond, really a, a beyond a three-month CD, then it's not a cash equivalent. We simply classify it on the balance sheet as a short-term investment. And if we go back and look at our current assets, we list them in order of liquidity. Cash and cash equivalents would be first, then short-term investment, then accounts receivable, inventory, supplies, etc. Okay, so this is simply a balance sheet classification issue. Where do we put it? If it meets the definition of a cash equivalent, 
then I put it with cash and cash equivalents. I combine the two into one number. <coughs> if it doesn't meet the definition of a cash equivalent, I classify it as a short-term investment, and it goes right below them on the balance sheet. So it's not that big a deal in terms of it'll get accounted for. The question is, where do you put it? OK, so examples of cash equivalents, certificates of deposits, called CDs. Money market accounts. Okay, Money market accounts are used when, for example, if you have a, a brokerage account where you invest in stocks or mutual funds, you may periodically sell some of those. That's your money. And your broker, your broker then sells the stock or the mutual fund, and that money gets put into a money market account. Sometimes they call it a sweep account. They sweep it in to your money market account, and then when you buy stock again, they use that money to buy that stock. So money market accounts are very low risk investments, very liquid since you buy and sell investments. That's a cash equivalent. U.S. Treasury bills. This is the United States government borrowing. They have short term borrowing, which are treasury bills. Treasury bills can be three months, six months, nine months, a year. You have treasury notes, which are typically between one and 10 years, and treasury bonds, which is typically between 10 and 30 years. So relating to treasury bills, if the treasury bill matures within three months, it's a cash equivalent. Very low risk. U.S. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills are considered to be some of the safest investments in the entire world. That's why so many foreign governments invest in U.S. Treasury bonds, because it's a safe investment. Okay, so if the Treasury bill matures in three months or less, cash equivalent. If it matures beyond three months, we simply put it in short-term investments. And then last is something called commercial paper. And you don't really have to worry about this. Briefly, what this is, is when very large companies like Ford, General Motors, Boeing, General Electric, they need to borrow money for operating purposes, for short-term operating purposes. And this is done through Wall Street. They can issue what's called commercial paper. And then rather than going to one bank for $50 million or $100 million, they can issue commercial paper to the invest in investing public through Wall Street investment banks and because they're spreading this money out, they're borrowing money, but rather than borrowing with this one big chunk from one bank, which would charge them a higher interest rate, they can go out to the investors, that's us, and we would pay for this and give them a lower interest rate, and we're still gonna earn a better interest rate on commercial paper than we would if we put it in a savings account, okay? So we earn a slightly higher rate of return. GE, for example, General Electric, who's issuing the commercial paper, they would pay us a lower rate than if they had to borrow from one bank. So both sides do better than if they had borrowed from a bank and we had our money in a savings account. Okay, So that's called commercial paper. And just like treasury bills and CDs, if it matures in three months or less, we consider it to be in a cash equivalent. If it matures beyond three months, it's a short-term, oh, excuse me, yeah, short-term investment. goes right below cash and cash equivalents on the balance sheet. Okay, so these are examples of cash equivalents and the whole issue here is simply how do we classify a particular investment? Should it be in the cash line on the balance sheet or in the short-term investments line? Okay, if it meets these definitions, we can call it a cash equivalent. Okay, and that'll do it for this lecture.